questions, question Zorrell, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister's carbon tax will increase the cost of everything. When companies are forced to hike their costs, it's more difficult to do business. When they have to compete with uh, companies not facing these taxes, uh, it is also something that causes job losses. So why is the Prime Minister ignoring the economic cost of the carbon tax, and why won't he finally tell Canadians exactly how much the cost will, uh, the, the cost will be for the Canadian economy? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we heard that approach under the Harper government excuses for not taking action to protect the environment. But by not protecting the environment, they did not honour their responsibility for creating an economy, a sustainable economy for the future. By focusing on carbon pollution and by working with communities across the country, we know that we can create economic growth while respecting the need to deal with the environment and respect it for future generations. Recently, the Prime Minister was in British Columbia lecturing Canadians on their personal behaviour. In fact, he was expressing his joy at the high gas prices, saying that, quote, it was exactly what he wanted. Now, we know that millionaires like the Prime Minister can afford to pay higher gas prices, but hard-working moms and dads don't have the luxury to pay thousands more in new taxes. So, how high does the cost of gas have to get before people start behaving the way the Prime Minister wants them to? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite knows that I said no such thing. They're continuing to try and create fear and division amongst Canadians as a way of justifying their continued desire to do nothing to reduce the impacts of climate change, to do nothing to protect the environment. That's what they did for 10 years under Stephen Harper, and that's what they're continuing to do in their approach. We on this side of the House agree with Canadians that it's time to protect the environment and grow the economy together. And that is exactly what we are doing. They, Mr. Speaker, don't even have a plan. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. <laughs> Our plan will not involve raising taxes on hardworking middle class. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister broke his promise on democratic reform when he didn't succeed in jigging uh, the system to benefit Liberals. Then he tried to, to jig the rules to weaken the opposition. The Liberals are having trouble with their funding. They are trying to put restrictions on other parties that aren't facing those problems. Why is the Prime Minister imposing new rules and uh, promoting a super PACs like in the United States. <laughs> On the contrary, Mr. Speaker, what we have done with our elections reform, election, with the reform of elections financing, is to bring greater transparency and rules to limit the influence of money in our politics. We need to create opportunities for people to fully participate in all debates without being influenced by money. And that is exactly the reform we're putting in place. It's what Canadians expect, and it's what we're delivering. Yeah. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Done at all, Mr. Speaker. Every time this Prime Minister doesn't get his own way, he responds by rigging the rules to benefit his own party. When he didn't get the electoral system he wanted, he abandoned all the plans for democratic reform. When the opposition parties proved too effective in the House of Commons, he tried to take all the tools away from parties that sit opposite from him. And now, instead of developing policies that encourage more Canadians to donate to the Liberal Party, the Prime Minister is trying to rig the next election by imposing punitive of rule changes on his opponents. So, why is the Prime Minister restricting the activities of political parties but making it easier for U.S.-style super PACs to spend huge sums of money? Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's actually not a great surprise that the Conservatives don't understand in the least bit what we are actually doing with electoral uh, financing reform. Uh, for they, their 
idea of improving the Canada's Elections Act in the last government uh, was to make it harder for people to vote while making it easier uh, for wealthy people to participate in uh, financing of political parties. We actually took the opposite approach. We know that limiting the influence of money in our uh, political system is for the benefit of Canadians and to the benefit of our entire political system. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Our changes led to more Canadians voting in the last election than in many, many elections before, for years and years and years. Now, but, but it's clear. It's clear that the Liberal Party can't attract the support from Canadians themselves. Right. They have had abysmal numbers fundraising, encouraging Canadians to make free decisions to donate to them. So he's imposing restrictions on what other political parties can do with the money that Canadians freely donated to those parties. So simple question, will he implement the same ban on ministerial travel and government advertising in the pre written I would ask the members for Coast to Bay, Central Notre Dame, and Cape Breton Council not to be speaking when someone else has the floor. And I'd ask other members to do the same. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to take this opportunity to set the, the record straight. It was a record number of Canadians voting in the last election, not because of changes they made to the Elections Act, but in spite of changes they made to the Elections Act. And and more specifically, because of the people involved in changing the elections, they were out to vote against Stephen Harper, not anything that Stephen Harper actually did to encourage them to vote. So let's be very clear about why Canadians voted in record numbers in the last election. It was about getting them out of office. The Honourable Member for Order. Alors. Order. Honourable Deputy. The Honourable Member for Muskin Nejet, Temiskwata Le Basque. After having given up uh, the reforms on the voting method, now the government is jeopardizing democratic institutions. The elections, uh, election, director of elections is an agent of parliament, and when normally we receive notifications uh, months in advance. Now, we're a mere 18 months from the actual general election. We've seen two candidates in less than three months, uh, three weeks, and we've only got seven days to provide an opinion. Does the Prime Minister think that this is an open, transparent, uh, merit-based process? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, following a rigorous and open process based on merit, Stéphane Perrault was identified as the best qualified candidate for the position of Chief Electoral Officer. Following 20 years of service to the government, he has a knowledge and in-depth understanding of the Canada Elections Act and the parliamentary system in this country. We are convinced that under his guidance, Elections Canada will be more than ready for the federal election in 2019. We have put forth an excellent candidate to the House. Uh, for more than a year and a half, the Liberals knew that we had to hire a new chief electoral officer, and they did nothing. For more than a year and a half, the Liberals sat on a bill to undo the worst of Stephen Harper's Unfair Elections Act, and they did nothing. So now, with less than a year and a half to go before the next election, the Liberals are panicking. Rather than work with us, they just sent us a letter a few weeks ago with just one name on it for a new chief electoral officer. Then just last week, they sent us another letter with another name on it, but a different guy. And Canadians <laughs> want to know what happened to the first guy, and when it comes to our democratic rights, why do Liberals have such a hard time getting the job done? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, after a rigorous, open, and merit-based process, Mr. Stéphane Perrault has emerged as the most qualified candidate for the position of Chief Electoral Officer. With over 20 years serving in government, he has extensive knowledge and understanding of the Canada Elections Act, 
and the Canadian parliamentary system. We have every confidence that under his continued leadership, Elections Canada will be more than ready for the 2019 federal election. We've submitted an excellent candidate to this House, and we hope that all members will confirm his appointment. I would ask the member for service, Moose Mountain, not to be yelling when someone else has the floor, verbally at all. Now, member for Skeena Bolkley Valley. It would have been better if he just said, your call is important to us, please stay on the line. <laughs> when it comes to the Kinder Morgan pipeline, the threats to our environment are well known. The threats to First Nations rights and title are also well known. But now we have a new threat to the Canadian taxpayer. Not only did the Liberals break their promise to put the pipeline under a proper environmental review and break their promise to respect First Nations rights and title, he's now negotiating in secret a public bailout to help an American oil giant ship Canadian raw bitumen to China. So why won't these Liberals simply come clean? Tell us how many billions this is going to cost us and how much damage he's willing to do to our environment and to First Nations. Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, layers of erroneous information in the question my the Honourable Member just asked. Uh, first of all, we strengthen the environmental assessment process for the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion, uh, did more consultation with Indigenous peoples, and we've actually got to the point where uh, there are 40, over 40 different First Nations organizations that have signed cost-benefit agreements and are very supportive of uh, this pipeline expansion project, something the NDP never talks about. Uh, furthermore, we have committed we are going to get this pipeline built because it is in the interests of Canadians, and we're engaged in financial discussions to do so. The Honourable Member for Rimouski-Negette, Temiskwate-Lebas. The Honourable Conservative in the Zip strengthen. I can't believe it. The chances are arbitrary in the morgue. The mandatory timeline is the 31st of May, and the government is in panic mode. Kinder Morgan is seeking an investment or compensation of $10 billion because of problems linked to the approval of the process. This is the Liberal government in 2015 had promised to put uh, an end to subsidies and money for this sector. Will the government put $10 billion into Kinder Morgan? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Once again, Mr. Speaker, the NDP doesn't seem to understand is that we have strengthened and added steps uh, to the environmental assessment process and the consultation process with Indigenous uh, communities to ensure that we don't uh, take or use uh, the broken process that existed under Stephen Harper. We know that we had to create a more robust system, and that is exactly what we did. When it comes to the financial discussions, we know that this is a, a project in the public interest, and we will re advance uh, responsibly in that regard. Position. Mr. Speaker, every time this Prime Minister faces opposition, either in this House or with the public. He takes away the tools that opposition parties have to hold him to account. Now, he is proposing to limit what political parties can do with money that Canadians have freely given to political parties. A very simple question. Will he impose the same restrictions on ministerial travel and government advertising in the lead-up to the next election? Right. Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, first of all, we know that it is the Conservative Party of Canada, when it was in government, that tried to tilt the rules to prevent people from bro uh, voting uh, and uh, to make more money available for political parties because it helped them. They extended the writ period to try and outspend everyone, uh, but Canadians didn't buy any of what they were selling, and that's why they're now on that side of the House. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have put forward proposals to reform the Elections Act, and we look forward to that proposal getting to committee and hearing any and all the suggestions that the members opposite will make to improve and, and, and strengthen. I have to remind the honourable member for Elgin Middlesex London that you should not be uh, speaking in a, throughout the time that someone else is speaking. On that, I picked the Richmond Arthur Basque. The honourable member for Richmond Arthur Basque. Mr. Speaker, Canada is an open and welcoming country. I think that we all agree on that here in the House. That's not where the problem is. People are crossing our borders illegally. Our customs officers are worn out, and the cost of managing this is going up. But unfortunately, the Liberals are incapable of showing leadership on the file. So my question for the Prime Minister is simple. Will he take responsibility and ensure that the borders in Canada are respected? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. 
Each person who crosses the border in an irregular fashion is stopped. This is what happens across the country. Following that, we analyze their files because we have an obligation under international conventions to enable people who seek asylum to show that they need to receive asylum, and we do that rigorously. If they are not deemed real refugees, they will be sent back home. We have a system that uh, impl applies in its integrity, regardless of how someone arrives here. Mr. Speaker, officials are expecting 200 illegal migrants to cross into Canada daily this summer, placing Im immense stress on our immigration system. Meanwhile, the Liberals are doing nearly nothing, nothing to support our seniors. Canadians are wondering why are the Liberals continuing to favour illegal border jumpers while ignoring the needs of seniors? Well, Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the stresses in our immigration system are largely holdovers from a Conservative government that did not invest in the kind of supports for our immigration system, that cuts resources to the Canadian Border Services, that continued to underinvest in the important processes that keep Canadians safe. In regards to seniors, unlike the Stephen Harper Conservatives, we actually are decreasing the age of retirement from 67 to 65. We've increased the guaranteed income supplement by 10 per cent for seniors. We've made new investments in the New Horizons program for seniors. That's going a long way to support them. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Manning. Mr. Speaker, as the nice weather arrives, thousands more illegal border crossers are expected to arrive with it, illegal. spurred on by the Prime Minister's reckless tweet. tweet, tweet, tweet. When the Liberals are rolling out the red carpet for these huge jumpers, people who came to Canada illegally are forced to wait even longer yep. to be reunited with their family. Can the Prime Minister tell newcomers in my riding? how this is fair. Yeah. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, once again, we see the same divisive approach from the Conservatives, uh, pitting uh, newest arrivals uh, against recent arrivals, uh, pitting one community of new Canadians against another community of new Canadians. That approach was what they founded their 2015 election campaign on, and uh, it didn't work with Canadians then, and the kind of fear and division they're trying to peddle now is not working with Canadians now. We are ensuring the application in its entirety of our immigration rules and laws and processes, we are ensuring uh, that we continue to be an open country that applies the rules. I would also ask the Honourable Member for Barry Innistel not to be calling out and yelling when someone else has the floor. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, saint charles Mr. Speaker, let's use some government facts here. Now, we know that uh, uh, 25,000 people uh, entered the country illegally in 2017. Eighty percent of them are rejected, but only 243 people were removed. Does Can the Prime Minister tell us how many illegal people will cost, cross the U.S. border over the next uh, few months? 10,000, 20,000, 50,000? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to reassure the member opposite and everyone in this House, as well as all Canadians, that regardless of the number of people who come to our borders, we will apply and enforce immigration procedures in their integ integrity, entirety. Rather. We will protect the integrity of our territory and the integrity of our immigration system. That is what Canadians expect. And and that is why we have confidence in our immigration system and in the acceptance of refugees. And was it? How many people are going to cross the border illegally from the United States into Canada this year and claim asylum? It takes a plan to bring humanitarian immigration to Canada. We need to ensure that there are resources for integration, which this government is not doing. We need to ensure that the world's most vulnerable are protected. You can't do that without anticipating yep. numbers. How many people is the Prime Minister anticipating will cross the border illegally from the U.S. into Canada and claim asylum this year? Honourable Prime Minister. 
Speaker, the member opposite wants to hear about our plan. We have actually engaged with communities in the United States, in Southern California, uh, in Florida, to talk about uh, the rigor with which we apply our immigration system and to ensure that they know that regardless of how many come to Canada, we will always be able to apply the entirety of our immigration system, of our rules, of our laws to any arrival in this country. That's what Canadians need to know. Regardless of expected or unexpected arrivals, we have a system that is strong and robust enough to deal with it. And the fear that the Conservatives are trying to spread is not helping Canadians. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. Expert in institutional hearings of the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry about to begin, and the Union of the BC Indian Chiefs, the only Indigenous political organization in BC withstanding, has pulled out because, quote, the hearings do not allow for a vigorous examination of the systems that contribute to violence against Indigenous women and girls. They will not sit idly by as Canada touts an incomplete process as success. What action will the Prime Minister take to fix this dire situation? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the perspective of the member opposite, but let me remind her that at the centre of the process around the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls inquiry our families. Uh, that is why we are focused on family-centric approach. That is why the Commission is focused on hearing from as many families as possible and engaging with them in a responsible way, because that inquiry is fundamentally about getting justice for the victims, getting healing for the families, and putting an end to this ongoing national tragedy. And that's what the inquiry is doing. The Honourable Member for Abitibi, Ray James Nunavik, you. Mr. Speaker, the Native Women's Association of Canada has just published a report criticizing the report of the, uh, the work by the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. The association finds that there is a lack of transparency and that it misses the mark. The report gave a failing grade in five out of the 15 sections analyzed and found the work in five other sections insufficient. This is one of the most important inquiries in our history. Does the government not find that someone's asleep at the switch and that is in fact the government itself? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, our government is pre prepared to put an end to this tragedy. The mandate of the Independent Commission is clear. Families are at the heart of their work. We are resolved to offering families the answers they have long expected on the systemic flaws and institutional uh, problems behind uh, this tragedy. Our government is also taking immediate and steps regarding housing, education, reforms for child services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On the topic of investor confidence in Canada, yesterday, the Prime Minister said that the reason why businesses weren't successful at attracting investment into Canada was because they lacked swagger. I guess that's a new economic indicator he's decided to make up apply. Mr. Speaker, what businesses know is the high cost of doing business in Canada, it's the higher in new taxes, and it's the unrelenting regulatory processes that they put projects through that causes the problem. Will he admit that he shouldn't have blamed CEOs in the country for failed liberal policies? Perhaps uh, the Conservatives would have had a better record on uh, job growth and economic growth during their time in office had they actually paid attention to facts. In fact, Canada is among the countries with the greatest ease of doing business of any of the OECD countries. Uh, we have consistently demonstrated through the high caliber of uh, hard work that Canadians are willing to do, our great education system, yes, our confidence in the future, that these are the things uh, that uh, investors are around the world are looking for. We are drawing in record numbers of investments in uh, extraordinary fields across this country. Honourable Member for Milton. I'm just wondering, Mr. Speaker, perhaps he's going to be changing the G7 agendas to include, you know, the importance of swagger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the importance of swagger is world economics. The reality is, is that there is a problem in Canada with respect to investor confidence, and it has to do with the fact that taxes are too high. It's too difficult to do business in Canada because of high costs, and you get stuck in a regulatory approval process that takes years to come out of. When will they stop blaming CEOs in Canada who work hard 
instead look to themselves as the problem. Yeah. Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, here are the facts. For 10 years, Stephen Harper had the worst growth rate in Canadian history since R.B. Bennett in the depths of the Great Depression. Over the past two and a half years, we have created hundreds of thousands of jobs, and last year, we actually had the fastest growth in the entire G7. Mr. Speaker, our plan of investing in the middle class, giving confidence to Canadians, giving confidence to investors is exactly uh, what is working for Canadians, and they just don't get it. Order. The honourable member for Lakeland. Order. There's some swagger. It seems so angry. Yeah. The Prime Minister promised Canadians a law that will ensure the Trans Mountain expansion will proceed. Now the Natural Resources Minister says legislation yeah. might not be introduced. The Liberals talk, but they've done nothing to meet the May 31st deadline. The Don't Prime Minister shocked. created this crisis. He misled Canadians with that promise. Now he claims his only option may be to force taxpayers to foot the bill, which Kinder Morgan didn't even need. A total failure. Yep. Can the Prime Minister tell Canadians how he will meet the deadline Don't and guarantee the expansion me. will go ahead? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, for 10 years they didn't get it done. They couldn't get one kilometre of pipeline to new markets through 10 years, regardless of all the boosterism they had uh, for the oil patch and, and uh, Alberta. What we've actually done is rolled up our sleeves and we're getting things done. We got the Trans Mountain Pipeline pipeline approved. We are moving forward on getting it built. We are working to demonstrate to Canadians that we understand, unlike Stephen Harper and his gang, that the environment and the economy need to go together, that we need to bring in Indigenous people into the success of our country, and that's what we're doing. Honourable Member for Lakeland. In fact, this Prime Minister killed Northern Gateway, yes, killed Energy East, yeah. and killed the Pacific Northwest that's LNG, right. Right. and now Trans Mountain is hanging by a thread. A new report says Canada's energy sector will lose $15.8 billion this year as a direct result of his cancelled pipelines. Canadian oil producers are forced to sell to the U.S. at lower prices. The Liberals are driving investment out of Canada at record levels, risking hundreds of thousands yeah. of jobs in all sectors and billions of dollars in investment in government revenue. When will the Prime Minister champion energy investment in Canada and stop jeopardizing Canadian oil and gas? Yeah. Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, what we have been able to do over the past two and a half years in investing in Canadians, investing in infrastructure, in demonstrating that we understand that growing the economy and protecting the environment go together uh, has led to tremendous new investments, has led to confidence in Canadians, in consumers, in investors. Uh, that is, uh, quite frankly, uh, a long shot from the terrible performance under the Conservatives under Stephen Harper. What they consistently did did not understand was giving confidence to Canadians in the future and growing the economy in responsible ways. What the Honourable Member for Laurier Sainte Marie. Mr. Speaker, we found out yesterday that the President of the United States is planning to withdraw from the nuclear deal with Iran. And the Liberals rejected my motion to study the role of Canada in the Middle East at the Foreign Affairs Committee. That's not surprising, given that the government refuses to discuss important issues like Iran, the Israelo-Palestinian conflict, or Saudi Arabia. This is a dangerous time for international security. Has the government signaled to our European allies its support for the Iranian deal? And what does it plan to do to ensure that its survival? The hon Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to support the process. When it comes to the agreement with Iran, the international community must remain cohesive to ensure safety. This is a time to stand with our allies. We regret the decision of the United States, which in our opinion is going in the wrong direction, and we said to our American allies that we think the best way to go forward is to work together and make sure that Iran does not develop nuclear weapons.
Mr. Speaker, despite the risk of nuclear conflict being as high as it's ever been, this Liberal government has done nothing on nuclear non-proliferation. Now the Iran nuclear deal, which was unanimously adopted by the UN Security Council as a binding resolution, is at risk. U.S. withdrawal from the deal represents a dangerous moment for international peace and security and shows growing disrespect for international law. This leaves the Nuclear Prohibition Treaty as the world's greatest hope for preventing nuclear war. So why won't this government embrace the rules-based multilateral system it claims to champion and finally sign the treaty? The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I've said uh, many times, Canada is proud to lead the way on nuclear disarmament and nuclear, uh, countering nuclear arms uh, by leading on the nuclear fissile test uh, cutoff treaty. Uh, we know uh, that leadership in ways that matters, it actually has an impact on behaviors around the world is what the world expects of Canada, and that's what we will continue to do. That's why we are standing uh, alongside the international community in uh, continuing to hold Iran to account, to keeping the JCPOA uh, in place. We regret the decision by uh, uh, the United States to pull out, but we are still hopeful we are going to be able to keep Iran from developing nuclear weapons. Honourable Member for York Centre. Mr. Speaker, in 1939, the MS St. Louis was carrying over 900 Jewish refugees from Nazi Germany seeking to escape persecution. To Canada's everlasting shame, the government of the day refused to provide that sanctuary. The, refugee, the refugees returned to Europe where many were killed in the Holocaust. Since being elected, I have worked alongside my colleagues for our government to recognize that tragic event. Yesterday, the Prime Minister announced what our government will do to recognize the wrongs of the past. Can he share with the members of this House? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member from York Centre for his question and for his tireless advocacy on behalf of his community. When Canada denied asylum to the 907 German Jews on board the MS St. Louis, we failed not only those passengers, but also their descendants and community. Canada's discriminatory none is too many policy of the time failed those desperate for safety and refuge from persecution. To acknowledge this difficult truth, learn from this story, and continue to fight against anti-Semitism every day, I look forward to offering a formal apology on the floor of this House. Member for Banff Airdrie. Mr. Speaker, in addition to a number of changes that weaken the integrity of our electoral system, the Liberals are also attempting to establish a register of future electors for children between the ages of 14 and 17. So can the Prime Minister please confirm that he will not allow the private information of 14-year-olds to be handed out to political parties or to anyone seeking public office? The Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we believe, unlike the members opposite, that uh, more Canadians should vote. And we know uh, that uh, getting young people all ready to be aware so that when they turn 18, they are able to vote uh, in, a, in a smooth and easy way uh, is a really important principle. Unlike the Conservatives, who actually prevented Elections Canada from doing youth outreach to encourage young people to know about our electoral system, we believe that bringing young people into the political system in a responsible and respectful way is actually good for our democracy. We're excited about this process. Member for Banff, Audrey knows he may not like the answers after he asks the question, but I'd ask him to listen in spite of that. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, in 2015, Canadians voted in large numbers. It was the highest rate of participation in Canada's history. But millions of Canadians were disappointed by broken promises, especially when it came to electoral reform. The Prime Minister swore, hand on heart, that this is the last time we're going to vote this way. Next time, it'll be different. And what did he do? He threw out his promise. Not, he didn't even recycle it. Among all the recommendations he's making, all the changes he's making, what is the Prime Minister's credibility when it comes to electoral reform? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, record numbers of Canadians voted in the last election for one reason alone, to bring real change and get Stephen Harper out of the Prime Minister's office, and it worked. We will continue to reverse the changes that Mr. Harper made to our electoral systems. We are going to make it easier for people to vote. We're going to encourage the involvement of youth 
to know more about our electoral system. We're going to limit the role of money and third parties in our electoral process because we believe that we need to defend the integrity of our electoral system. Senator Lake Eastman. Mr. Speaker, an ISIS terrorist who returned to Canada in the past few years recently gave an interview with the New York Times podcast, The Caliphate. In the podcast, Abu Husayfa states that he worked for ISIS enforcing Sharia law in Syria. He brags about getting splattered with blood while brutally lashing people who broke their laws. And he proudly admits to murdering ISIS prisoners and having, and he said, the bloody irony smell on his hands. Mm. When is the Prime Minister going to stop allowing these bloodthirsty terrorists to walk on our streets, but throw them in jail instead? Mr. Speaker, once again we see the Conservatives trying to drum up fear is uh, a way of political attack. Uh, we have uh, every reason to be responsible and serious about how we protect the integrity of Canadians but, uh, and the safety of our communities. But Quite frankly, uh, it, it, illustrations like that question, or, for example, the attack ads they put out that featured footage of ISIS executions for political gain are below the norm and shouldn't be acceptable in Canada, and the Conservatives have a lot to answer for if they're going to keep up that same approach in the upcoming election. Honourable Member Selkirk, Interlake Eastman. Order. Oh, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is actually running away from his responsibilities here. It's a cop out. I'd like to remind everyone that the Prime Minister hasn't hesitated in giving special treatment to terrorists, like offering classes for returning terrorists in poetry and podcasts. And of course, he loves writing checks for $10 million. Canadian ISIS terrorist Abu Husayfa is walking freely on our streets, though he publicly confessed to joining a terrorist group, sadistically enforced Sharia law, and slaughtered dissidents, and, and he calls it like they were animals. When will the Prime Minister finally imprison ISIS terrorists instead of allowing them to use Canada? The right honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, once again, we saw this approach in the last election by the previous government. It doesn't work to try and scare and divide Canadians. Our security agencies take all potential threats very seriously and use the full toolkit of measures, including surveillance, the no-fly list, revoking passports, and laying criminal charges when sufficient evidence exists. The expertise of Canadian security and law enforcement professionals is highly respected around the world. Our security services are doing their work in spite of over a billion dollars in cuts they suffered under the Harper government. Bingo. An honourable member for London Fanshawe. Mr. Speaker, this Friday, Canada will be held accountable for its human rights record at our third periodic review at the UN. Safe and equal access to abortion is the right of all Canadians, yet this remains shockingly inconsistent. Women living in rural areas often travel unacceptable distances to access an abortion clinic. It's unconscionable. When will this government use the Canada Health Act to grant all Canadians their right to safe and equal access to abortion? Here, here. Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member opposite for her question and her hard work standing up and fighting for women's rights right across the country. We agree with her. We know that it's safe and easy access, responsible access, affordable access uh, to reproductive health services, uh, including abortions, uh, is of fundamental importance to all Canadians. That's why uh, we move forward on ensuring that all provinces are offering that. We continue to work right across the country to ensure that the Canada Health Act is, uh, is brought in, and we will always be unequivocal in standing up for a woman's right to choose. The Honourable Member for Salaberry sur Roy. I can't believe what I just heard, Mr. Speaker. Order. Alors. Shh. Député de Salaberry. The Honourable Member for Salaberry sur Roy. It's a right and everyone needs to understand that, Mr. Speaker.
L'ONU s'apprête à effectuer sa... The United Nations is getting ready to conduct its periodic review of Canada's respect for human rights. Safe and fair access to abortion is part of those rights. While the Prime Minister boasts about his feminism during five-star receptions with the rich and famous, many women in the country are facing obstacles when they try to access the treatment they are entitled to. That's unacceptable. How does the Prime Minister plan to ensure, in very real terms, that every woman can access abortion services safely? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, since we have formed the government, we've worked with provinces that offered unequal or no access. We're working with them to ensure that reproductive services and that women's choices are protected. On this side of the House, along with the NDP, we agree that, yes, a woman has a right to choose what happens with her own body, and we will always defend that right in spite of what the Conservatives think and say. Order. The Honourable Member for Lévis Lobignard. Mr. Speaker, once again, we're being taken for a ride by this Prime Minister, and believe me, this won't just be a big fish story. It's well known that the Liberal Party always favours its pals to the detriment of a clear, just, transparent, and fair process. In the face of the probable interference of the Minister of Fisheries in awarding fishing licenses for a lucrative type of seafood, I ask why has the Minister once again favoured his pals over maintaining much desired harmony with First Nations? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, reconciliation with First Nations involves creating economic opportunities for them. We're proud of the approach that we have taken to generate economic growth for First Nations communities when it comes to the Arctic surf clam. I'm very proud of what we are doing. We're going to continue to create opportunities for Indigenous peoples. If there's a question or a concern, I suggest to my friends on the other side to talk to the Ethics Commissioner, but I can tell you that everything is in line with the rules on this side of the House. Prince George. Not so fast, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, recently released court documents in the surf clam legal battle reveal that the group called Five Nations that was supposed to satisfy Indigenous involvement in the fishery is actually 75% owned by the brother of a Liberal MP. What we've also learned through these recently released documents is that Five Nations is headed by Gilles Thierot. Who is Gilles Thierot, you ask? None other than a cousin of the minister's wife. <coughs> Was the prime minister aware of the minister's family's connections in this bid? Right honourable prime minister. Mr. Speaker, in this house, as we've seen from time to time, there are accusations of ethical impropriety thrown as political attacks. What we have is an ethics and conflict of interest commissioner who is in charge of evaluating the facts and making dispassionate findings that Canadians can have confidence with. And if they are making accusations around ethics and conflict of interest, uh, they should work with the conflict of interest and ethics commissioner to ensure uh, that everything is being followed. But I can I assure you that on this side of the House, we respect the work of the Conflict of Interest and Ethics Commissioner and follow their instructions. Honourable Member for Caribou, Prince George. Mr. Speaker, the Minister personally intervened in the surf clam process. He ordered the Department to award the lucrative contract to a group that didn't have a boat. They didn't have multiple First Nations partners. They weren't even incorporated. What they did have was close family ties to the minister and to the Liberal Party. Mr. Speaker, does the Prime Minister think it's appropriate that the minister is awarding million-dollar contracts to the Liberals and his own family members? Prime Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, we understand that for the Conservatives, mudsling is just a way of doing politics, and personal attacks uh, is all they seem to have to go on because it's really hard to attack us on the number one growth record in the G7 on the creation of 600,000 jobs. So they stick with the ethical attacks, which is fine, but Canadians need to know that we have a conflict of interest and ethics commissioner there to look into the facts of the matter and make determinations on whether or not the mudslinging is grounded or groundless, Mr. Speaker. Honourable député de Sudbury. The Honourable Member for Sudbury. Mr. Speaker, as an entrepreneur, I know firsthand the hardships and struggles to get investment and funding to turn an idea into a business. This is one of the largest obstacles there is in creating a more entrepreneurial economy. As we compete in the innovation race, I was delighted to hear that over $100 million in Canadian venture funding will be granted to Salesforce. Can my, the Right Honourable Prime Minister, I thank the member for Sudbury for his question and his work. We support Canadian entrepreneurs by helping them to access capital and acquire technical know-how. Canada Trailblazer, recently launched by Salesforce, is a great example of how entrepreneurs can draw in investments from around the world. We're also investing $400 million to make venture capital accessible to more advanced stages of development, going up to $1.5 billion in Canada to help the middle class. For, for Durham. Mr. Speaker, Taiwan is being blocked from participating in the World Health Assembly, which is meant to bring countries together to work on health issues. Fifteen years ago, Canada and Taiwan were on the front lines of the SARS crisis, and that shows why Taiwan should be a participant. Will the Prime Minister show some global swagger and take a public position in support of Taiwan joining the World Health Assembly, or will he remain silent due to his admiration for basic dictatorships? few times in this question period, the Conservatives seem to have an issue with the idea of swagger, the idea of Canadians being strong and proud on the world stage, Canadians understanding that being back on the world stage, being positively engaged, being confident about our investments in AI, our investments in new technologies, our investments in the economy of the future are things to be proud of here in Canada. No, we will not apologize for swaggering when it comes to talking about to be proud of the decorum in this place. The Honourable Member for Beloit Chambly, order. Mr. Speaker, currently, New Brunswick is experiencing the worst flooding it's seen in years. The water level is starting to go down, but the situation is still urgent, and it's far from going back to normal. Many roads are still closed, and many residents still can't get back into their homes. We know that the damage will be considerable, and there will be a lot of cleanup to do. My question is to find out what the government plans to do to help the province and flooding victims to quickly get back on their feet. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we recognize that all throughout the country, like Kelowna, Alberta, Ontario, and especially New Brunswick, there are a lot of challenges when it comes to flooding. We are still working very closely with local authorities to determine whether the federal government needs to intervene. Currently, we are very pleased with the cooperation we've seen. We've been help, helping the Coast Guard, who is assisting people in New Brunswick. We are going to support the victims of flooding everywhere. Mr. Speaker, people in New Brunswick, including my riding of St. John Rossay, have been hit hard by flooding. 
There have been evacuations, road closures, power outages, and boil water advisories due to possible sewage contamination. We are very grateful for the first responders and everyone else who has been helping friends, neighbours and strangers impacted by the floods. Can the Prime Minister tell us how the government is supporting response and rescue efforts? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I said, all our thoughts are with the people across the country afflicted by floods and with the first responders and volunteers working so hard to keep them safe. I thank the member from St. John Rossi for his question and his New Brunswick colleagues for the work they've done to help their constituents during this tough time. We've responded to all the province's requests for assistance, including Coast Guard rescue boats and RCMP security patrols. We are, as always, in very close contact with provincial authorities in New Brunswick and across the country, and we remain ready to respond quickly to any additional requests. The Honourable Member for Belchasse des Etchemins, Lévis. Mr. Speaker, we found out that the Prime Minister will finally be in a riding without an MP for months in Saguenay. It's a great opportunity to keep his promise, which he gave in January. Saguenay needs icebreakers for economic development and thousands of jobs depend on it. The Coast Guard's fleet is aging and it is urgent to make a decision now to get ready for the next season. Will the Prime Minister finally award those four icebreakers, including AVIC, to the Davy shipyard to ensure the economic prosperity of the people of Saguenay? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we recognize, first of all, the excellent work done by Davy's workers, who delivered Asterix in exemplary fashion. We recognize how important it is to continue to support them with good jobs that will lead to good opportunities for Canadians, including those in Saguenay. We are currently negotiating with Davy Shipyard on awarding several icebreakers, but negotiations are ongoing to find the best approach for Canadians and for workers. That is what we will continue to do. Both islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A little-known and anti-democratic provision of the Trans-Pacific Partnership appears to be making its way into NAFTA. It's called Chapter 25 in the TPP. What it does is reduce the abilities of governments to pass regulations of the public interest while expanding the powers of foreign corporations to object to regulations. Yeah. My question to the Prime Minister is, is this true? Is the so-called regulatory coherence provision from the TPP entering NAFTA? And will this Parliament have a full opportunity to study, debate, yes. and vote on NAFTA before we sign the bottom line? Honourable yeah. Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the member for her question on the good regulatory practices chapter of the NAFTA negotiations, making sure nothing impedes our government's ability to implement needed regulations is an important principle in which we believe. This is about encouraging regulatory harmonization where it makes sense to do so. As with any agreement, it will be tabled in the House. However, at this point, we are still in the negotiating process, but the Minister of Foreign Affairs would be happy to provide a briefing to the member from Sandwich Gulf Islands or any other member on this topic if they request it. I would like to draw to the attention of honourable members the presence in the gallery of His Excellency Timo Soini, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Finland. I would also like to draw to the attention of honourable members the presence in the gallery of the finalists for the 2018 Shaughnessy Cohen Prize for Political Writing. Carol Off, Sandra Perron, Ted Rowe, and Tanya Talega.